My guest on this episode of Southern Search is Dana DiTomaso, co-founder of Kickpoint Digital. I've been a fan of Dana's for a really, really long time. In an industry with a lot of really smart digital marketers, Dana stands out. She's an in-demand keynote speaker, blogger, and industry veteran. She has presented at virtually every major industry conference. A short list includes MozCon, Brighton SEO, Local U, Content Jam, and many of the SMX events. In 2018, Dana was nominated as the SEO Speaker of the Year by Search Engine Land. I'm going to start our conversation by talking about a presentation she did at WhiteSpark's local search summit titled Level Up Your Analytics. In her presentation, she challenged digital marketers to take the responsibility of maintaining customer analytics accounts more seriously. Earlier in my career, the only Google products available to measure and evaluate data were Google Analytics and Google Search Console. Today, marketers need to know Google Tag Manager, Google Data Studio, and local SEOs begrudgingly rely on GMB Insights. I've learned a lot from Dana about how to use each of these tools. During our conversation, I asked her about how to use Tag Manager to measure micro and macro conversions, how to put GMB Insights into context, and how to use customer empathy to make better reports in Google Data Studio. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Dana DiTomaso. We'll geek out on data and discuss why she doesn't like to present customer data in the classic tables model commonly found in spreadsheets. I'll ask her a few questions about her beloved Hamilton Tiger Cats of the Canadian Football League. Dana DiTomaso, welcome to Southern Search. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to have you on. This is a big get for us. I've heard you present uh, a few times and I, I love everything that you present on. One of the things I heard you, this is all, all the way back in September now, but I heard you at Darren's conference, which I thought was outstanding. Everybody was great there, but you had a really good presentation. One of the things that you started out by saying is that uh, you have to be responsible with analytics data. And I think to sort of set the table for our conversation, the, people who didn't watch that presentation, maybe that, that sounds strange. Uh, analytics shouldn't be controversial. It should be, <laughs> shouldn't be subjective. Um, mm -hmm. In theory, those things would be true. In reality, what is the case? I think that, I don't think people are necessarily malicious when they approach analytics and they decide that things like somebody spends 30 seconds on the page suddenly is no longer a bounced visit. Like, I don't think they enter it saying that I'm going to do this because I want my bounce figures to look really good, for example. Or, you know, if people visit two pages on the site, I want to count that as a conversion and therefore your conversion rate looks spectacular. I think it's more a matter of not understanding the long-term impacts of presenting the data in this way. So a great example I have is one of our clients, um, they, when they came to us, took a look at their analytics and of course they've got ads running and they're doing SEO campaigns and everything else. And they had a really fantastic conversion rate. And then when I took a look at how analytics was set up, their goals were set. So if someone viewed the contact page for each location, say multiple locations, that was a goal. They didn't have to follow up the form. They didn't have to call anybody, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And it's so common. And I don't think and I know the agency who set this up originally and I know the people there and I don't think they did it maliciously. I think it's more out of just sheer ignorance of not understanding like the long term implications of that. And of course, one of the reasons why this client left is because they kept seeing, you know, hundreds of leads. But then at their end, they're not seeing hundreds of form fills or phone calls coming in. So when they would say that to the agency, the agent would be like, no, the goal's set up right. So it's just a complete disconnect between you know boots on the ground, what the client's seeing and what the agency has set up and not really digging any deeper into that and saying, you know, how can I best represent the reality of what this client is getting in an analytics and reporting scenario, you know? And it's just, it's kind of sad because they could have held on to this client if they reported better, basically. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think just out of the box analytics, you, you have a phrase, I wanna make sure I get it right. But it's like, um, something like you have a responsibility if i'm a digital marker i have a responsibility to talk about the limitations that analytics mm -hmm. comes with out of the box so that's part of yeah. my job that i have to be able to come and say you know they're not going to show you everything and we're going to have to stitch some things together uh where do you see that what do you see that responsibility for a digital marketer i think explaining how cookies work is a really important piece that i don't think a lot of people do um and also explaining things like 
you know, at midnight, all Google Analytics sessions reset. So if you have an international business, you know, where you set that time zone is actually going to be really important because it will point. influence how your sessions go, right? Or that the typical session length is 30 minutes and explaining, you know, what exactly that means or how many people leave pages open in their tabs for weeks and months. So if you think you have all these page views, but then you look at the average, you know, the actual true duration, then it might be nothing because it's just the tab reloading all the time. And then explaining things like, how does Google actually calculate average duration, which is also really sad when people learn what it's actually calculating, which is not what people think it's calculating, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a matter of just education is so important. And the clients, they want to know. I mean, if the client doesn't want to know, then I mean, you can be like, this probably isn't a good client for us. And mm -hmm. certainly one of the things that we do at Kickpoint is we really focus on training and education. So if a client does not want to learn, then we'll send them off to another agency. That's no problem. But I also think that, you know, this is one of the tools that you need to report on and you need to think about as a business. So I think it really behooves you to, to know the basics of what analytics is telling you. And sometimes even things like ad blockers. I can't even tell you the number of times I've mentioned an ad blocker and clients are like, oh, no one's ever mentioned that before. And then you start to look at comparing server logs to GA and it's maybe 20, 30% of their overall users are using ad blockers. You know, yes. and it's just yeah. that I don't use it so nobody does type attitude. I get it. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm caught on that word limitations a little bit. When I first started using, when I first started doing this, there was no such thing as tag manager. There wasn't a way to, <laughs> so the way to set yep. up a goal would be like a destination page goal. That's how we did it. Oh, totally. Yep. And uh, now you have with, with tag manager and you're, you're so great. All your presentations are great on tag manager, but you can get a more insightful, uh, you know, understanding of your conversions of what's really working for you. What, mm -hmm. what is limited in out of the box analytics that can be corrected with tag manager in terms of just like that, that destination URL goal that I, I mentioned instead of using events. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing is just, um, and this is something I always explain is like destination goals. They're necessary if you're doing a funnel, for example, but you also have to understand that people are going to come in and leave at different points. And one of the problems too, is that one of the pieces of advice given over years and years of marketing is that thank you page that you get to after you fill out a form or whatever, it should be useful, but because it's useful, people leave it open in their browser and therefore you're misrepresenting browser sessions. Yeah, <laughs> so right. it's where like, that's not necessarily the best way to, to do this is that destination goal. And it is so easy now with Tag Manager to set up those goals. Like you should just, just do it because I remember, so this is actually uh, my 20th year working in, the, working in the land of digital marketing. I started back in 2000. And I, uh, it's funny because pre Google Analytics when it was like, I think Urchin, when it just came out and then Google bought them, I think in 2004, um, I looked in my oldest GA implementation goes back, I think to 2006 or 2007 for one client. And it's interesting because I set that up back then. They've been a client for many, many years. And what's interesting is like over the years, the core bits of GA really haven't changed much, right? You've right. got different names, like they're called channels now, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's still source medium campaign you know, there used to be called visitors, they're not anymore, right? But the basics are still there. Annotations hasn't changed at all <laughs> yeah. the whole time we've been using GA, right? I, I saw a guy on Twitter who, who it was so perfect, perfect. Like by default, if you click on organic traffic, you'll still mm -hmm. see the default metrics are keywords. Yep. Well, they haven't provided keywords for no, what, years. What was it, 2013 or something? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's been a while. It, it, not, it hasn't really fundamentally changed that much, right? No, it really hasn't. And I think this is what's exciting about the new analytics GA4 is that it does fundamentally rethink what analytics should be. But that's not ready, I think. If you're doing anything serious with analytics in terms of custom dimensions or serious metrics tracking or anything like GA4 is not ready for you yet, um, it will be probably the next year. But right now, it's at this moment, it is not ready for you. But when Google Tag Manager first came out, it was really complex and difficult to understand. It was really like a developer tool. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I used GTM, I was like, oh, this is really hard. It was GTM one before they came out with a new interface. And I put it aside, I was like, I'm not gonna worry about this yet. And then finally one year, I think maybe five or six years ago, I finally buckled down and said, okay, this is the year I learned Google Tag Manager properly. <laughs> And mm -hmm. then that is basically where my world shifted because it's like, well, we can track all these things. Why aren't we doing this? And mm -hmm. one of the things as an agency over the many years of working with clients is really seeing, you know, they want to know about results. 
And that's because, you know, they're giving you money. They want to know they're getting something for that money. And I think by clearly defining those metrics, which may not necessarily be things like sales, you know, really working with them to figure out what their metrics actually are and what matters to them um, and reporting on those in a way that they understand the limitations of that reporting. So knowing, for example, that if you're tracking people coming to the site over time and you want to know, like, people come to the site three times, but... 20% of your audience is using Safari and therefore the cookies are going to reset every day. So we really only understand 80% of our audience. Just being honest about those things can go a long way to deepening a client's understanding to what they're actually looking at instead of just logging into analytics and saying, oh, users, bounce rate, pages per visit. You know, yeah. it, it's so much deeper than those basic metrics, which do not apply to a lot of businesses necessarily. You know, without question, the context is so important. The other thing I, I've had a, a number of guests on here who, who point this out, we get a little bit obsessed with conversion numbers mm -hmm. in, in digital marketing. One of the ways that you, you've uh, suggested using tag manager is to actually see how people are using your site. Are they actually seeing the call to action that you want them to see? Do they mm -hmm. ever actually click on that Facebook icon that you have on there? Or would that real estate yep. be better used somewhere else? How do you use tag manager to, to accomplish like, I, I want to actually see how people are interacting on my site. Yeah, so definitely we'll record things like a call to action entering the viewport. Um, we recall, recall, we record things like uh, average scroll depth, for example. We also, uh, for one client, we're actually recording um, because they sell very large, expensive pieces of equipment. And what we think is happening is that people are using their site to grab bits of information about it and put it in their RFPs, for example. And so we actually have a thing that records what text people are copying on their website. Another client isn't sure what language they should translate their site into next. We have a sniffer detecting Google Translate sessions and then wow. determining, you know, what language are they translating it into? And then we know, okay, oh, yeah, so you yeah. need to go Spanish next or French next or whatever it might be. So I think that there's a lot you can do with it. And I think a lot of it is really only limited by your imagination in terms of understanding, you know, what's gonna help you have a deeper understanding of the client and the idea of micro conversions versus macro conversions. So most of the time, I would say our standard Google Tag Manager set, and just trying to think of what we have in there, like we have taps on an email address, taps or clicks on a phone number, PDF downloads, accordion opens and closes, like an FAQ pieces. I always like to know about those, like which of those are people interested in. Um, we usually have at least a couple of CTA visible in the viewports, um, form fills, of course, you know, and then we just add on what makes sense for that specific client situation. But we always we have a couple of base tag manager containers we always build off of, and that's typically included in all of those. Fascinating. Well, I I want to you know here's a data source that is uh, beyond reproach. I heard you speak at local U GMB mm -hmm. Insights uh, is hardly hardly ever had a problem with mm -hmm. with any of the data out of there. Uh, I thought you had a really interesting way to use GMB Insights though. Maybe describe, there are some sort of, you have some really funny examples of how GMB insights can go terribly wrong. There's a screenshot from somebody who is like, I just set up a GMB page and I already have a hundred, I had a hundred visits before, uh, hundred impressions mm -hmm. before I ever set it up. Um, yeah. What are, what are some of the struggles with GMB insights and how can you kind of make sense? How can you get anything useful out of this stuff for those of us on local? Yeah, that's tricky. I think you kind of have to rely on people coming to your website or calling you. So certainly what I always recommend is using a call tracking number in your Google My Business uh, listing. And to do that properly, uh, WhiteSpark actually has a great blog post on how to set that up to do that. Um, we use CallRail for most of our call tracking. So we, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that that's really useful. And that's really eye-opening for clients too when they do start to use those numbers because then they see exactly how many phone calls they are actually getting from Google My Business. Mm -hmm. And because that number can't be stopped by an ad blocker, that is 100% of the phone calls that are made to that number are, unless it's spam calls, but most of it is real people who meant to call that number or you get a couple of wrong numbers in there. And so I find that that's really interesting for people to realize and understand. The other thing is too, is a lot of people don't UTM code the links leading from Google My Business to their website. Um, and they don't UTM anything for their Google posts, their products and services, like you have to UTM all of that. All of and so one of the things I would say is, you know, really set a structure for yourself and how you're going to UTM this stuff. We use a combination of source medium 
campaign and content. So we know yeah. exactly not just it was a post, but it was this specific post that drove people there. And you'll see conversions from individual posts and then you know which ones to do more of, for example. Fascinating. Well, the last thing to talk to you about, I've, you've mentioned this a couple of times, this, this friction that can, can exist between the consultant or the, the digital marketer and the, and the client, the, the end, the, mm -hmm. the person who pays the bills. Um, usually this is reporting. And I think mm -hmm. this is everybody's least favorite part of their job around here at Search Lab. And it certainly was mine when I was doing a lot more individual contributor work. Uh, it's also kind of how you get fired sometimes. And I'm not talking mm -hmm. about, I'm not talking about if your report is lousy, you just, you're not doing a good job. I mean, I, the, take that out of it. Let's say you, you've made a report, yeah. you've used this example, you made a report that's 48 pages long. Maybe it's even good. But the client, it's like a trip to the dentist every time they got to talk to their SEO because it's so painful. I've stolen a mm -hmm. lot of your tips for for reporting. I wonder if if I could if you could indulge me with some of these. One of them is that it should really only be one page. You like to have one page reports. Ideally, yeah. Um, right now, with one client, we actually have a report that's um, mobile phone size, so it's very small. I think there's eight metrics on it. It's for their CEO. So in that case, I'm working with the CMO, and she said, this is all the CEO cares about. Great, we're going to make a tiny little report, little up arrows if things are good, down arrows if things are down, only reporting on the metrics that matter to the CEO specifically. And in this case, um, they're a not-for-profit organization. So it's people using a specific tool of theirs that they offer to their members. And so that's the top line metric is, you know, did people come to the website from their email campaigns? Did they actually use the tool? Were they able to successfully complete the task? So people logging into the tool versus the percentage of people who are successfully completing the task in the tool. Great. That's all they need to know. The marketing team then has a top level report for them that's sort of more metrics. And then on top of that, they have a diagnostic, what I call a diagnostic dashboard, which is all the nitty gritty stuff that you want to check on on a regular basis. So a giant page of just all the events happening because we're tracking a lot of events, right? So, uh -huh. you know, on this page, what are all the different events that occurred on this page? If I want to find out how many times this specific video was viewed and to what length, you know, those kinds of nitty gritty pieces, that shouldn't go in a report because literally no one cares, right? <laughs> right? And I think that's something where people are like, but it matters to me, but it does not matter to people who aren't you. And yeah. one of the questions I'll sometimes ask people is, you know, for your performance review, what are you going to be judged on? Great. That's the report we're going to make for your leadership. <laughs> you know, like what is going to yeah. keep you looking good? Then let's make that happen, you know? And I think the other thing is too, is that we get really caught up in this idea that if you're paying me a lot of money, then I should be making a huge report. But I don't think that's the case. And I think that's just like an insecurity in your work. And I get that it's super hard to get over, especially if you're new in the field and you're looking at the results, you're like, I think this is good. I don't know, right? And so you think that you have to make these big reports so that people are like, yes, I see you doing work because it's really difficult. If you're a furniture maker, you make furniture, right? If you are a graphic designer and you print business cards, you have this physical business card and we're just like, SEO, you know, <laughs> I think that that's really hard for people to get their mind around. And so it's like, if you build a report for SEO and one of your goals for the year is increase SEO traffic, then that's what you should be showing is SEO traffic going up. You should have a line on the report to say, we wanted 30% year over year. Here's what it would be if it was 30% from last year. Here's where the actual traffic is. Great. You know, that's all you need to show. Just leave it there. Yeah. And then you can talk to the client about hopes, dreams, goals, issues, not like on page 42, I'd like to draw your attention mm -hmm. to the fact that the people watch this video for one minute, 48 seconds and this video, one minute, 46 seconds. Like, Nobody cares. Yeah, you're, you know? you're, taking, you're, you're taking me back in time to some really awful phone calls I've been on, yes, uh, where I was the person <laughs> doing that. Uh, so, no, and I, I think, I, not to belabor the point, but I just think these are such good tips. The other one is you shouldn't have to be there for the person to understand the report. So yep. that in that example you had, in theory, the CEO, they understand what those metrics mean. They understand and, why they're and they open it up on their own. I showed them how to change the time period if they want to look at different dates. I told them not to go too far back in time because obviously stuff wasn't set up back then. Um, and they look at it and you can put Google Analytics on your Google Data Studio reports so you know if people are opening them or not. And yeah, the CEO goes and looks at it, I think probably about once a week. They'll just poke their head in there. And then I saw that they were opening it about once a week. So I said, do you want me to just set the default time period to be weekly? Great. 
you know, and then they can always change it to something longer if they want. But I think that's something that's really just really paying attention. And it's those kinds of touches that make a difference. You know, it's um, so my business partner, Jen, uh, we own Kickpoint 5050. She had this great point a few years ago and she was talking about the idea of, you know, what's the toilet paper point of digital marketing? Because when you go to a hotel, one day we will go to hotels again. <laughs> you go to a hotel and you know the hotel room was recently cleaned because there's a point in the toilet paper You're in the right. bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like that extra, like, I was here. And so what is, you know, your own toilet paper point when it comes to the work that you do that shows that you have that attention to detail? And it could be something like, hey, I was watching and I saw that you open this report once a week. I'm going to change the default time period to be weekly. Great. You know, it's just something, it doesn't have to be spectacular. It doesn't have to be an enormous gift basket at Christmas. You know, it doesn't have to be like a wacky video. You know, it's just, what is that thing that's going to let the client know that you truly care about them and their business and they won't, you know, you want them to be a client for years to come. I think that's really what makes a difference. Oh yeah. And it, it, I, I think it's, you, you really do understand the empathy for the person on the other end of it because mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to have it. It doesn't help anybody. So uh, my, my, one of my last questions, I, and this is kind of out there, but I've seen you in your, in your presentations, you'll toggle between data studio and tag manager and analytics and GMB and sometimes Zapier. And mm -hmm. one of the things you don't seem to, uh, and I haven't seen all your presentations, but you don't seem to have Excel sheets or that, that Excel or spreadsheets are a big yeah. part of it. It's a, it's, it's, it makes some sense. Your 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 presentations aren't about Excel, but for a data person, that struck me as interesting. Are you actively trying to use less spreadsheets in your life? I don't think it's on purpose. I think it just sort of happened. Um, yeah. I spreadsheets are really ugly, and I think particularly when you're uh, one of the points I have been making in my presentations is that as marketers, I think we approach everything from a spreadsheets first, tables first perspective. Totally. But if your client is a visual learner, they're going to hate you for doing that, you know? Oh, and I think so that true. a table is probably the worst way to present results, you know? And I know we make fun of things like pie charts, um, you know, spark lines and all that other stuff, but visually like that is the best way to show how things are going. And I think you really need to get to know your client and how they want to learn. Like some of them are super nerdy. And I have one client who just, he likes going into analytics. He doesn't need a report. Great. Here's analytics. I'll take you on a tour of the things that are set up. You knock yourself out. Right. Mm -hmm. And other clients are like, I never want to look at that thing. It's confusing. I just want to know this, you know? So maybe you just want a scorecard. Maybe you want a single number. Maybe you want a, a chart of some kind, a graph of stacked bar, right? What's going to make the most sense to the client? Um, one of the chart elements, for example, that, that clients find really interesting is I've been using a donut chart stacked on top of a pie chart. And so the okay. donut is uh, sessions by device. Mm. And then the pie in the middle is conversions by device. And if there's a huge disconnect in the slices, then you know that like people on mobile are super struggling to convert on your website. You got a great thing for a visual learner to see that. Right? That would be great. And yeah. you just look at it and you know. And I think that's one of the things, again, going to that that rule of reporting is you shouldn't have to be there to explain. That report is pretty self-explanatory, yeah. right? Like that element. And then they say, oh, crap, there's something wrong with our mobile. We've got to talk to the devs, right? Sure. I think that's things like that really help illustrate the point very quickly in a way that a table is never going to do. Even if you had the same information in a table, like two rows, it doesn't have the same kind of visual punch that a donut stacked on top of a pie does, you know? And I think that's where we can really uh, do a better job of trying to, you know, help people learn. And certainly, I mean, I read my, my own background actually is not marketing. I went to school for geography and ecosystem sure. restoration. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of what I worked on was definitely tables and charts, but also things like stream flow diagrams. Like how do you map out the way a stream is gonna go over time? You know, how do you map out erosion? How do you figure out how much of this hill you're gonna have to remove to fix the erosion problem? And I think that's part of where it comes from is just the idea that sometimes a drawing or a chart is gonna show you way more than a table is gonna show you. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I think, yeah, I learn something every time I talk to you. That's a great insight about tables. I, I'm probably way over reliant on tables now that I think about it. And I think everybody I, is. If I said to you, make a report, the first thing you would think of would be sessions by channel. Totally. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's every marketer, right? Like, okay, first thing is sessions by channel, but is it? You know, is that actually <laughs> the first thing you need to report on? And is a table really the best way to do that? 
So yeah, I think that that's just, just really dial it back and have a rethink about the best way to present things. Um, I gave a talk at MozCon way back, I think it was 2014 now, uh, called Prove Your Value, it's on YouTube. And this is the first talk I ever gave on reporting. And I didn't realize it was gonna kind of blow up the way it did. I had so many questions afterwards. Uh, and I think that's really where sort of the reporting journey started because I realized there was a real disconnect in the industry about reporting and how people were struggling with it so much. I thought it was just me. No, no, it's wow. everybody. It's and everybody. we still do. Yeah. And so the things that I said back then, I think are just as relevant today, except the reports might look a little dated because it's old screenshots. <laughs> I'll, 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 I got to make sure I, I link to it in the show notes so people can find it. So. And I have better hair now. But. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Um, yeah. Well, this is everyone's favorite part of the show. Greg gives me a question that uh, he gives me no context to the question. Oh, no. Great. And he, uh, I think he took it easy on you because he started out and he said, oh, for Dana, there's a lot of things, but you can't put it on camera. So I'm not going to tell you any of those. <laughs> oh, good. So his was pretty tame this week. He said, ask her, how was the move? Did you recently move your, your business or your I home or something? I did. Yes. So I moved uh, from Edmonton, Alberta to Victoria, BC. And for people who don't know Canadian geography all that well, it's the um, south, I think, yeah. Yeah, Edmonton is pretty far north. Um, it's three hours north of Calgary, which I think a lot of people know where that is because the Olympics. And it's a pretty cold place. It gets down to, it can get down to minus 40, and that's the same Fahrenheit and Celsius. Uh, and my wife is from the West Coast, Victoria, British Columbia, which is sort of, it's on Vancouver Island, which is not where Vancouver is, which is nice and confusing for non-Canadians. And Victoria is about halfway between Seattle and Vancouver. It's one of the furthest south points. And so um, the weather here, like today, it's raining. It's you know, 10 degrees Celsius. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. No, it's a lovely West Coast kind of day. Nice day so it's yeah. definitely a big shock for me because I always grew up in a place where you have a white Christmas and that's not, <laughs> it's not the case here. You know, I'm not going to have to shovel snow. Um, but being from here, my wife is like, I can't take this winter anymore. We got to move back. So we finally made the move in May. Uh, and yeah, I've been really loving it so far. It, pandemic notwithstanding. <laughs> I'm amazed. I, I moved during the pandemic. We moved in October and like I've a lot of people I know have moved this year just because lots of people are moving. Yes. One of our clients is a moving company uh, and we just wrote a case study about them on our website and boy, they are busy this year. Business is booming. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, and, and last question, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, what is the status of Jeremiah Masoli? Is he ever going to win a great cup? And <sighs> well, they'd have to play are, first are off they, for them to what, win a great what cup. Is, what is the status? I, I, that's how much I know about the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I think I think Manziel had a cup of coffee there, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he played for the Alouettes. Yeah, in oh, Montreal. The Alouettes, so, okay. yeah, yep. I he's done now. So I, they didn't play this year because one of the things with the CFL is they're delightful, but they're very small, and a lot of the revenue comes from gate revenue. And if they couldn't make any money on tickets, then they just couldn't financially make it work. Right. So they did release the schedule for next year. Hopefully, enough people will be vaccinated by then. It'll actually happen. I hope so, because I do love the CFL and I want it to continue um yeah i would love it if the tie cats won a great cup it's been a while it's 1999 yeah, yeah i, I was there <laughs> i did a little research so yep. yeah i was living in hamilton at the time and i was able to go to the game and to like fly out to the game so yeah i was <sighs> i would love for them to win but it, in the meantime i'm just watching a lot of nfl i'm seriously into fantasy football because okay. it's just data <laughs> You know, fantasy yeah, football is right. like data, but with people instead of, you know, analytics, Google analytics. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I've definitely been watching a lot of NFL games for sure. All right. Well, I am a Lions fan and it's been a lot longer than 1999 since. Yeah, we I'm won really it. sorry about your choices. Since we've even won a playoff <laughs> game, I'll be honest. So um, I don't have a favorite NFL team yet. I mostly enjoy who's on my fantasy team and is doing a good job. So right now I'm really enjoying James Robinson of the Jags. <laughs> He's, that's a good pickup. Yeah. Very nice. I picked him up after the draft and he was the best thing I did this year. So that's a yeah. nice pickup. Well, very mm -hmm. good. Thank well, you. Well, Dana, thank you so much for coming on. This, this means a lot. I learned so much from you. I, I really mean it. I probably still, you know, you can make the data say whatever you want. If you torture it long enough, all these phrases <laughs> I've learned from you over the years, uh, you're really, uh, you've really helped me out. And I know a, a ton of other SEOs. So it means a lot for you to come on Sunset Search. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, cheers, everyone. We'll see you next next time on Sudden Search. Cheers.